When first coming into office in 2010, Governor Brown faced budget shortfalls of upwards of $20 billion. In just three short years, however, the state has, quote, reached a point where its underlying expenditures and revenues are roughly in balance, unquote, according to the nonpartisan legislative analyst. Indeed, Governor Brown is projecting a $1 billion surplus for the coming year. Is this significant improvement in the state's finances a mirage, or is it for real? We'll ask. H.D. Palmer, the Deputy Director of External Affairs for the California Department of Finance. Mac Taylor, leader of the state's nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office, or LAO, who is credited by both parties as providing accurate, unbiased information on fiscal and policy matters. Veteran political columnist Dan Walters of the Sacramento Bee. And John Myers, political editor for News 10 in Sacramento. The governor's 2013 budget, back in black? From Fresno. The Maddie Report, with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Welcome. To those in the know, our guest, Mac Taylor, the California Legislative Analyst, is the go-to per person for accurate, unbiased information on the state budget. We're delighted to have him back on the Maddie Report. Welcome. So, your budget reports, at least for the last several years, have been a little bit downbeat. Um, this year, however, you say that the governor's budget, quote, reflects a significant improvement in the state's finances. How so? Well, the last time we've gotten together over the, over the last few years, we've been talking about deficits in the tens of billions of dollars. But over the last four years, we have been making expenditure reductions and slowing the growth in spending. Uh, and now we finally have an economic recovery, even though moderate, the state is growing. And of course, the third big reason is with the passage of Prop 30 in the last election, that's bringing in quite a bit of new money to the state. So I think we're at that point where the state's finances are roughly in balance. We've brought that expenditure line and that revenue line fairly close together. Roughly in balance. Roughly in balance. Oh, okay. Um, there is a $1 billion surplus in the governor's uh, proposed budget. That's a little different than what you said in November. Your agency said that we're going to have a $1.9 billion deficit. So what accounts for the change? Well, that's a, a roughly $3 billion difference between where we were in November and now where the governor's budget poses. And I think there are three main reasons. First of all, there's just forecasting differences. The administration, for example, on revenues has about a billion dollars more in revenues that they're forecasting for our major taxes. There are also expenditure differences in just the way we do forecasting. We have some, a couple of significant differences, one on redevelopment-related solutions that, uh, based on actions we've taken in the past. So, th so they have more savings than, than we did in, in November. In redevelopment, you're assuming that they're not going to get as much as they say they're going to get. Exactly. Okay. And the third reason is the administration has, has proposed kind of new solutions to address either part of the problem or to build up the reserve. Uh, he's proposing to extend a couple of health-related taxes, and he's proposing to extend some special fund loans. So those were things that we couldn't possibly have foreseen in November. What, what is the economic forecast for California? Well, it's kind of where it's been for the last year, that is, moderate growth. Uh, we definitely have not come out of this recession the way that we have in the past, where sometimes you get some very quick uptakes, and you can get back to kind of where you were before the recession hit fairly quickly. This is a very long, drawn-out, deep recession. We're coming out of it rather slowly, and so we're forecasting rather moderate growth. But at least we're growing. When you say uh, quick uptakes after a recession, is that, what, about 4 or 5% growth? Oh, no. You can grow by 8 and 10% when you come out of a recession. And right now you've said moderate growth, which is, what, 2%-ish? 2% in employment growth and maybe 4 or 5% in what we call personal income growth. Okay. Um, you also say in your report that, quote, uh, federal policy is uh, the key to forecast risk now. So things like the debt ceiling uh, and budget negotiations in Washington, uh, how do they impact California? Well, a couple of ways. I think people first think of, well, we're going to have less federal dollars coming into the state because they'll sequester or reduce spending at that level. And that, that is an impact, but it's not a huge one because many of the large programs, such as Social Security and Medi-Cal, health care for low-income people, are not covered by this sequestration. But if you're in an area like a San Diego where you have a lot of military, if they cut defense, they cut uh, university research, you could feel the co sort of local impacts. But the real concern that we've mentioned is if as a result of those actions at the federal level, they're not resolved, you could have a, a real downturn in both consumer and business confidence. You could have retrenchment on the part of investment. And we're more concerned, frankly, about what it could mean for the economy, the national economy, 
and of course, then th how that impacts it's the like California economy. Things that happen in Europe or things happen in the Middle East could it's also impact. Absolutely, and those things are really big risk for us. Well, what do you see as the most most positive aspects of the governor's budget? Well, I think that we've commended the governor for his proposal. I, I think he's shown fiscal restraint. There's not a lot of augmentations for, for new policy proposals. And even more importantly, he's uh, obviously shown a commitment to paying off some of these past budgetary borrowings and actions that we've done to try to kind of get our fiscal house more in order. So not only in the budget year, the coming 13, 14 fiscal year that starts next July 1, but even in his out years, he proposes to schedule the repayment of some of these debts to get us back in, I, I think, better shape. What are your major concerns with the governor's proposed budget? Well, I don't. Th I, I say we don't have serious concerns. I think on the big picture, uh, if you look out, we still don't have a big reserve at the end of his the forecast period, looking out about four years. And while the governor has recognized our very large retirement-related unfunded liabilities and obligations, he hasn't proposed anything in his plan to start addressing those. So I think on the big picture, that would be our concern. And then we raised other issues uh, with regard to particularly some of his uh, school proposals and higher education proposals. He's put a lot of really good issues on the table. Uh, and in many cases, we think that those are good ones. And in other cases, we've suggested areas the legislature may want to think about. They're going to have to go online and read your report if they want to get the details, I guess. Well, I want to thank Mac Teller, uh, the California Legislative Analyst, for being here. Up next, we'll hear from one of the governor's chief spokespersons on the budget, H.D. Palmer from the Department of Finance. That conversation in a moment. This is the Matter Report. Like every governor, Governor Brown has his priorities. And like others, he defines those priorities by his spending proposals. So what are they? We are fortunate to have a key spokesperson for the Brown administration back with us today, H.D. Palmer, Deputy Director of External Affairs with the California Department of Finance. Welcome back to the Maddie Report. Thanks for having me back. So what are the governor's key priorities as set forth in the budget? Well, the key priority is education. Um, we have gotten to a remarkable place relative to where we've been just in two years ago. We were looking at a $26 billion budget gap. Right now, we are at a, a point where we've got structural balance for the foreseeable future under the governor's plan. We got here two ways. Number one, we made very difficult but necessary reductions in spending, which have to be ongoing. And number two, the voters put a lot of trust in the governor and the legislature when they voted to pass the governor's uh, ballot initiative, Proposition 30, last year, which is going to dramatically improve uh, the outlook for funding for K-12 through schools and community colleges. So the priorities would be reinvesting and renewing our investment in education, both in K-12 and higher ed, as well as maintaining fiscal discipline in the rest of the budget. Let's talk about some specifics. Um, there's a lot of attention being paid to the governor's proposal to change the way the schools are, are financed. That's a pretty big deal because K through 14 education, far and away, is the biggest expense in the state budget. It takes up about 40% uh, of the budget. So how does the governor want to change school financing, and will there be winners and losers in that process? One of the things that the academic research has indicated to us is there are students who have greater challenges to learning uh, than others. Uh, I'll give you some numbers to flesh that out. There are about 6.2 million kids in K-12 through schools in California right now. Of that amount, more than half, 3.3 million of those 6.2 million kids are either English learners or they are coming from an economically disadvantaged uh, environment. Those are the students who have the greatest need. So what the governor is proposing to do is to increase funding for all school districts over a multi-year period, but have an additional incremental increase for those districts that do have English learners and, and low-income students is defined by their eligibility for either free or reduced price lunches uh, because the governor believes that for those students who have the greatest challenges to learn, we want to give them the greatest opportunity to succeed. It is not, as some would contest, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Everyone is going to grow. It's just that the governor believes we need to have another increment of that growth going to target those students who, who have more challenges in terms of learning than others. Okay, well, what about this issue of deferrals? The governor wants to spend $1.9 billion uh, to pay down deferrals. First of all, what are deferrals? Mm -hmm. And second, um, why is the governor spending almost $2 billion to pay them down? Well, one of the things that's happened in recent years uh, when we've been in an economic crisis is that instead of cutting the appropriation for schools, uh, the legislature has set a fixed amount, but they've paid a portion of that one fiscal year later. In other words, they will say through June, we're going to give you X, but we're only going to give you the cash for a portion of X you know, in July, the new fiscal year. 
uh, that's basically borrowing to float the state budget on the backs of a lot of school districts. So, so school districts have to take out loans or take, if they've got money in reserve, they've got to spend that money? Right. For districts that have got good lines of credit, good reserves, they've basically floated the state. Those districts that are smaller, uh, rural areas, charter schools, those who don't have good lines of credit, they've basically been the ones that have been hurt the most by this. So the governor, as, as part of paying down what's called the wall of debt, is accelerating the repayment of those deferrals back to schools, which is in turn giving them more cash on hand. Okay. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the Affordable Care Act or, or <clears throat> Obamacare. Uh, that allows states the option of expanding Medi-Cal coverage to certain adults with incomes slightly above the federal poverty level. Um, who are not currently covered, uh, not eligible under a Medi-Cal. How much is that going to cost, and what exactly does it mean for those folks? Well, there are going to be two expansions. One is mandatory, and the other is optional. Uh, the budget contains a $350 million placeholder for that mandatory expansion. As for the optional uh, expansion, the governor is proposing, and not mandating, but proposing two potential courses. One, it would be a state-managed expansion uh, from Sacramento. The other, it would be a county-based expansion because you can't look at the expansion of health care reform without looking at the fiscal relationship between the states and the counties. So, is this kind of an, uh, part of uh, Governor Brown's move toward local control? I mean, he's, you're seeing this in a lot of areas, a realignment uh, here in the health area, in education. It, it may be in part. Again, the governor wants to go through this thoughtfully. He wants to have a, a detailed discussion with the legislature and with local governments because what we decide to do in terms of expansion is necessarily going to involve or affect county budgets, and he wants to make sure that they're at the table. Okay. Um, what about the big ticket items? I think folks are wondering about those, things like high-speed rail, water infrastructure, public employee pensions. How does the governor address those issues in his budget? Well, on, on the water issue, we are continuing work on, on the Bay Delta plan. That'll probably be finalized at some point this year, and that's a comprehensive plan that's designed to do two things. Number one, ensure a reliable supply of water for the state. Number two, ensure the ecological soundness of, of the Delta system. So, very complicated issue, a lot of interest involved. He will continue uh, that work during the year. High-speed rail is continuing on, on, on its schedule. Uh, there is just I like that on schedule. Right, it's a good analogy with the trains. Right, right. It, it's it's running on time actually. There you go. Um, we've just had the authorization for negotiations with landowners on the first segment. Uh, bids are being open for the construction of that first segment. So uh, we're we're working our way through the process as it's as it's supposed to be. Okay. Well, um, I want to ask you the other thing about public employee pensions. Is there going to be any work done in public employee pensions this year? Well, remember that there was a very, very significant change in, in pensions last year. The governor insisted upon and the legislature agreed to his plan on pension reform. Uh, we are implementing that. That's going to have significant savings going forward, uh, and we're reducing some of the uh, excesses of the past in terms of, like, buying so-called airtime or buying credit that you didn't earn for your retirement. Okay, I want to thank H.D. Palmer for being here. Uh, up next, we're going to talk about the politics of the state budget with two veteran capital uh, re reporters, John Myers, political editor for News 10 in Sacramento, and Dan Walters, political columnist for the Sacramento Bee. That conversation in a moment. This is the Matty Report. So we're finally over the perennial budget crisis that seems to grip California every year. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by some of our favorite and most knowledgeable folks covering state politics. Uh, John Myers with uh, Political Editor for News 10 in Sacramento and Dan Walters with the Sacramento Bee. Thanks for coming back to the Matter Report. Happy to. Um, well, uh, Dan, uh, Governor Brown ran for governor in 2010 on the premise that he's going to restore a semblance of fiscal stability to state government. Has he kept his promise? I think if, it's, if you qualify by saying a semblance, he probably has, although uh, at the moment at least the budget appears to be uh, balanced and income and outgo, but there are any number of pitfalls in that. It depends on what happens in the economy. It depends on whether these taxes that he's gotten the voters to approve really generate as much money as he thinks they will. And, and then it kind of depends on a lot of long-term things that are, haven't been yet addressed, such as the unfunded liabilities in in pensions and in, in employee health care and, and debts that go way beyond his so-called uh, wall of debt. They're really more like a mountain of debt. So, and plus the fact that these taxes are temporary. So, you know, they run out at some point and then what, what then? When he leaves office. About the time he leaves yeah. office, yeah. So, at the moment, yeah. In the longer term, not so certain. Yeah, I think? mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, I think all of those qualifiers are exactly right. 
Um, you know, people look at budgets uh, that they do in state government, they try to apply it to their household budget, which I think is, is just a complete false balance there because, I mean, government doesn't work that way, either for better or for worse. But, um, I mean, there are traditional balancing tools of taxes and cuts, and I think it, it compared to budgets of the last few years, it's a more traditional uh, budget. Yeah. I mean, it does have real taxes in it. It does have uh, spending limitations in it, but there are assumptions in it, and I think you know, the issues of a reserve and all these other things are going to be a lot of the debate this year. You know, we have a notoriously uh, volatile revenue structure in, in California. We rely heavily on the, the top uh, tax earners, and they're invested heavily in the market. The market can do anything, up and down. So is that going to upset the apple cart here? Well, I certainly think that this budget relies on those upper income people more than other budgets for a couple of reasons, and most notably for, for Governor Brown's Proposition 30, which had only increased income taxes on the most wealthy, quarter of a million dollars for people who are well, single. Well, small sales tax. Well, the, yes, but, but if, you look at the, if you look at the big part of the revenue and you look at, and we, again, we talk about income taxes, they're only on the most wealthy. Um, those people, right, they, they get their money off of capital gains. A at this point, about two-thirds of, um, of all the money coming into the general fund are from income taxes, and most of that is coming from the wealthy. So, yeah, we really are riding that volatility wave. Now, Jerry Brown has said, as uh, others have said, we've got to do something about that, and that gets to the issue of reserves and rainy day funds, and we haven't really resolved that. But, yeah, I mean, we're, at this point, we've got our fingers crossed that those people are going to make their money. Yeah. That's a dramatic change, by the way. Uh, in sales taxes were a much larger factor than income taxes when Jerry Brown was governor the first time out. And now income taxes are about twice as much as sales taxes in terms of revenue and a much more volatile thing. So this is something that's gone, happened historically, a big change over the years. And keep in mind, too, that uh, part of Proposition 30 was temporary and part was permanent. The temporary part, of course, was the income and sales taxes increases. The permanent part was a dedication of the sales tax portion to the counties for uh, the realignment program, and that is a more stable source of revenue, sales taxes, income taxes, uh, which now we have more of for state budgeting not as stable. Ongoing uh, promise for uh, paying for programs but not ongoing revenue. Uh, let me ask about um, the cuts. Not everyone did well in this budget. The courts, for example, took a $200 million hit. Um, is that cut and other cuts, are they likely to stick? Well, Jerry has said on several occasions, and I'm not proud of him on several occasions, that the cuts that have been made in the budget over the last uh, couple of three years, he expects to be permanent, including the cuts to health and welfare programs, the so-called safety net. Because if you look at the numbers, it's kind of hard to get away from that because this new, these new taxes basically make up the deficit, but it doesn't make up for the cuts that have been made uh, beyond that. I mean, if we had a general fund budget at one time of $103 billion. It would probably be $120 billion now had it not been for those cuts, and instead it's going to be maybe $100 billion. So, and this is one of the, one of the political issues is that the people who value things, whether it's court services, health services, welfare services, they're going to be pressing the legislature to make up those cuts. And Jerry said, hey, there's no money to do that. And I think a key thing, Mark, I would just say a key thing is I think that by the governor declaring that the budget was balanced, that the deficit was gone, I think he goes into this debate saying, hey, look, things are even Stephen here. You want to do something, you show me how to do it. Well, well one way they may say is, look at that um, $1 billion reserve. Mm -hmm. How about some of that money? Yeah. Uh, you know, Democrats are in the supermajority in both houses. Uh, they may want to spend some of that money. Republicans and maybe some conservative Democrats might want tax cuts. I mean, could that happen? Well, again, I think, I think the governor goes into this debate with the notion, again, that uh, I've got everything even. You show me how it's going to pencil out. I mean, I think we've fought about reserves over the last few years. I mean, that's been the source of the legislature gives him budget X, the governor line item vetoes down to get a bit of a reserve. Yeah, and a couple of things. You look at what he has in the reserve. Those are where some of his proposals are, like this um, managed care tax and other things, too. And I think also... Uh, this is where Democrats do play that game about uh, how much money you've got. You know, I want to ask you, Dan, about um, the wall of debt, and he's trying to pay this down. Is there going to be pressure there to maybe not pay it down as quickly, um, you know, like a, a family doesn't want to pay off their credit card as quickly, just pay the minimum balance? Well, in fact, this budget uh, does, it cuts down the payments to the wall of debt from what the governor proposed last year. So he's already moved in that direction to try to make things come out even. Yes, that's the other source of potential new money to restore some of the cuts would be to delay the payment of debts. The problem with that is that the biggest chunk of those debts are owed to schools. So are Democrats saying don't give the money to the schools, spend it itself instead on something else, 
and that puts them in a bind as well. You know, this is a this is a zero sum game, and you, you you squeeze it one place, it comes out the other end. All right. Well, when we come back more on the politics of the state budget, this is the Matty Report. Welcome back. Uh, we're talking with John Myers, political editor for News 10 in Sacramento, and Dan Walters, a political columnist for the Sacramento Bay. So, John, uh, one area that's getting a lot of attention is the governor's school financing proposal. Um, but how likely is it that we're going to see uh, real reform in school financing this year? Well, I think it depends on the definition of real reform. It's a complicated issue. I mean, we've got a tremendous number of rules that state government has put in place about how schools spend their money. Uh, the governor is talking about doing away with a lot of those. And, of course, the centerpiece of this whole thing is diverting more money to low-income uh, schools and uh, English learner students. Um, I, think, I think it's a tough one to, to do, but it's probably the right fight, and it's probably one that the voters care about. Yeah, it's, it's a Byzantine structure. I've heard that you know, only three or four people, maybe the entire capital, know how school financing actually works. One of them's Dan. And, and, and <laughs> so, basically, those three or four people never agree on how it works, by the way. So what do you think? Real reform in school financing this year? It is a, it's a tough slog, as John says, because basically he's trying, trying to use the new school money from the new taxes to lubricate a revision of this, the way you divvy up the money saying everybody's going to get some more, but more. some people are going to get more and more, and some are going to be less more. And basically the more and more would go to urban school districts, inner city school districts, and rural school districts, and it would be the suburban school districts that would, be, would lose out. And that's, that creates a kind of a political rivalry, one of these other zero-sum games, and uh, there's going to be resistance to it for sure. And I just would say, Mark, I do think that, that uh, Valley inland areas are, are going to probably benefit more than coastal areas and that could be another you know fight too. Do you think there's maybe a grand bargain here where some of those sub suburban districts, wealthier districts might go along with this if they change the, the number for uh, what it takes to pass a school measure from two-thirds to a bond measure? Uh, That'll certainly be part of the equation is the proposal to change the uh, vote margin on parcel tax, the so-called parcel taxes from two-thirds down to 55 percent or a simple majority. But even that's not a simple thing because it turns out there's a court decision that kind of calls into question how they've been doing this in the past. And so they, the people in some school districts want to fix on that, and that makes the situation more, even more complicated. There's nothing simple about school finance. There's nothing that's ever going to be simple about school finance. It should be simple. It isn't. It's never going to be. Well, let's talk about another simple issue, and that's uh, <laughs> expansion of Medi-Cal oh, yeah. um, under Obamacare. You think that's going to mullify some of the more liberal Democrats uh, in the Assembly and the Senate who want to see the cuts to health care programs restored? I, I don't know that you can mollify some of that. I mean, I think, first of all, I mean, you know, it's the overused cliche of the century, the devil's in the details. We don't really know how the implementation of federal health care for reform works. We don't know what it costs. We don't know how many people are actually going to come on board. Um, and we don't know how much is administered by counties versus administered by the state. All of that has to be resolved. I, I don't know how that, uh, per se, could mollify some of those cuts. Though I, I understand the point. I mean, I think you could be starting to loop all of this together as a negotiation. And, and initially, the federal government's going to pay for this expansion of Medi-Cal. But over the long haul, they're going to start pulling out of it, and the state's going to be stuck. And it's one of the long-term issues of the budget that we could wind up spending three or four or five, six billion dollars a year for this expansion down the line, just about the same time those taxes expire. Well, what do you see as the overarching theme of the governor's budget? Stability. Uh, he just he wants to kind of keep things, as John says, on an even keel and uh, try to get through the rest of his governorship without having the perpetual budget crisis. I think it's always been a bridge. It's always been a bridge deal. That's what the taxes were, too. I think he's hoping that the economy comes back and he has time to fix some of this, and I think this is part of that bridge. Uh, what about local control? Is that a, a big part of, of the governor's budget? I mean, with realignment, education, a movement? Yeah, he, he uses the word uh, subsidiarity. You know, which is Jesuit is, training. Well, it's actually out of an old thing in the Catholic Church. I'm going to have to look that word up. But it basically means that you should do things at a lower level of government if they can be done right down to the level of the individual, as a matter of fact. And he makes a big thing about this, and uh, it's been kind of unringing the bell that rang after Proposition 13 passed in 1978, where the state gathered a lot of this stuff into its bosom. I really, think that, I really think that Brown learned a lot as mayor of Oakland. I've always thought that, and I think that's colored the way he has approached the job of state government now. Well, I want to thank John Myers, Dan Walters. I also want to thank 
uh, H.D. Palmer from the California Department of Finance and Mac Taylor, the California Legislative Analyst, for joining us. If you want to stay up to date with uh, state and local politics, you can link on to Dan and John's uh, video blogs and uh, podcasts by logging on to our uh, website and looking at the Maddie Daily. And now, another perspective. The best time to look for a new job is when you already have one. The best time to shop for a new car is when you don't need one. The best time to deal with most issues in life is before they become a crisis. In the same way, California's legislature has an opportunity now to conduct some business that will have lasting merit for our state. For the first time in more than a decade, Sacramento is not facing a fiscal crisis. Governor Jerry Brown has submitted a tentative budget that most observers agree is close to being balanced, or at least closer than any budget in years. For the first time in many lawmakers' memory, they will not be confronted with onerous choices in passing a balanced budget. For the first time in many years, the governor proposes a budget that would pay down debt and not add to it. Unlike the past several years, the governor's budget includes stable funding for education, thanks to the infusion of revenue from Proposition 30. This budget will also allow the state to return some concessions made by state workers, such as furlough days. As the governor and some members of the legislature have noted, a more stable fiscal picture for California presents some opportunities for reform. Governor Brown has called it a year of fiscal discipline. Nobody has any illusions that one annual budget will solve California's fiscal problems. The state's finances are still dependent on the boom and bust cycle of markets and other fiscal trends. Some reformers have called for structural reform of the California state budget, an overhaul of how the state earns revenue and spends it. Without the pressure of a budget crisis, the timing of that initiative couldn't be better. This would also be an auspicious time for lawmakers to set aside partisanship in addressing some of California's structural deficiencies. Relieved of the din of ideological bickering, lawmakers can address issues with dialogue instead of diatribe. Senator Ken Maddy was an advocate of the former. His strategy was to work through partisan differences in a spirit of compromise and cooperation. The Matty Institute works to promote understanding of opposing political ideas while informing people how they can get involved to make progress. Promising fiscal projections have a way of coming unraveled in Sacramento, and it remains to be seen if the state budget will truly be balanced in a way that avoids winners and losers. But if this is a time of calm after so much fiscal turbulence, it would be well not to waste the opportunity for reform in a spirit of nonpartisan cooperation. For the Matty Report, I'm Paul Hurley. The views expressed in the Matty Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the Matty Institute, the California Channel, Casey, or Valley PBS. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions shared in the Matty Report, visit our website at valleypbs.org. This is Mark Kepler for the Matty Report. Thanks for joining us.